speaking, but everyone, welcome to our Coexisting with Wild Neighbors presentation. My name is Carly Padilla, if you guys don't know me, and I am the Wildlife Education Specialist, and um, I'm really excited to have you all here, and Elkie's going to go ahead and talk a little bit about our housekeeping. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Elkie Wills. I'm the Director of Community Engagement, and we're so excited to share with you our very first webinar. Um, Carly and I just did training the other day, so um, my first housekeeping tip is hopefully you can bear with us and understand if we have any delays in anything um, and or any quirks on things that we're testing out, but we appreciate you being here to learn and then, of course, assist us in learning as well. Um, so just so you know, this webinar is being recorded, so we will share that with you next week, which will also allow you to share it with friends and family, which is so important, obviously, um, springtime coming into gear here. Um, so if you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A box. Um, if you don't see that, let us know in the chat, And um, but you should see things down at the bottom of your screen if you move your um, cursor back and forth you'll see some things pop up for you. Um, time permitting, uh, Carly will get to those questions at the end of the presentation. However, Kate will also be um, typing in the answers if it's something that she can cover right away. So we know that we might not have enough time at the end, so we'll try to get those taken care of. If your, an if your question doesn't get answered, Carly will answer it after um, we shut the um, presentation down. If you have any technical issues, um, please go to the chat box and you can message me privately. You can actually click the drop down and um, message me. Now, if I can actually answer that question, <laughs> it will be, but I will um, jump on the Zoom support to see what we can do for you. And of course, if we experience any technical difficulties on our end, like a bandwidth, things slow down, things start freezing, we'll make sure um, we share those slides with you too. So it won't just be the recording, it'll also be the slides. So we are gonna go back to Carly and enjoy your time with us. Thank you. All right, thanks Elke. And uh, we'll have some polls going on throughout the session today too. So um, don't fall asleep on us because we will really want your feedback on these as well. So let me get back to my, there we go. All right. So uh, probably a lot of you guys already know this information, but some of you guys may not, but Project Wildlife, we are a wildlife rehabilitation organization here in San Diego. We are one of the largest wildlife rehab centers in the United States. We started in 1972 with a few little ladies who didn't know where to take a wild animal when they found them, if they were sick or injured. Um, most people want to go to their nearest veterinarian when you find a wild animal, but a lot of veterinarians will not allow you to even walk through their front door. Well, a little bit different now, but they won't allow you to walk through their front door with a wild animal because they don't know probably how to take care of it. They don't want to risk their staff on getting injured. So that was how Project Wildlife kind of came to fruition, is that there wasn't exactly a location to send these animals to. So Project Wildlife started and we were going strong. And uh, we will average anywhere between 11 to 13,000 patients a year right now. So our first poll is going to be, why do you guys think we are getting so many animals? So Elkie's gonna go ahead and launch that poll and we'll give you probably about 20 seconds to answer it and uh, we'll see what your guys' answers are. Okay, so once I launch, um, the question is going to be, what are the main reasons wild animals come into Project Wildlife? Please answer one with one option, please. Or no, you can answer all, you can pick you as can't? many as you think, yeah. Oh, I thought it said multiple choice. Oh, multiple oh, no. choice. Yeah. Well, we're giving it away. Just look at the <laughs> answers. <laughs> Sorry, I'll stop talking. <laughs> So yeah, what do you think the main, some of the main reasons are that animals come into Project Wildlife, car strikes, cat caught, dog caught, they're so sick. Like, I think everyone has voted, so I'm going to end the polling and we will share the results. You guys are smart. Thank you guys for answering that question. So really good answers, caught by a pet, misidentified as orphan, um, but all in all, it is all of those answers. It is tree trim, car strikes, we get animals for all sorts of reasons. So let's go ahead and move on. Do you close that out, Elkie, or do I? 
Oh, I did, didn't I? Okay, well now we go. Do you see it, everyone ready? Okay, let's see. Oh my, this is not working, I have to use the cursor. So, San Diego, extremely biodiverse city, my friends. So between the oceans, coastal sage scrub, mountains, desert, chaparral, grasslands, wetlands, we have almost every single habitat here in San Diego except for Arctic tundra and rainforest. So in this wonderful city that we call home, a lot of people want to live here, a lot of animals want to live here, and we cross paths with wildlife all the time. And unfortunately, when we cross those paths, it's not always positive. So Project Wildlife, not only do we have a lot of animals that live here, we are also on three migratory flyways. They're highways for birds, so they're called flyways. So we have three different routes that come through San Diego. So even during wintertime and summertime, we have even more species here in San Diego. So any given year, Project Wildlife will touch over 320 different species of animals. Um, and so that is another big reason why if anyone is coming across a wild animal, it is so important to encourage them to bring them to Project Wildlife because we are always continuing to learn how to best care for these wild animals, how to make sure that we're feeding them the best proper nutrition for them. Um, and so we're continuing to learn. So we always wanna make sure that we're encouraging people to bring that injured wild animal to Project Wildlife. Coexisting is our word, you guys. We always wanna make sure that we're encouraging people to live together with our wild neighbors. Um, right now, they need our voice more than ever, and especially right now when people may be going on more walks or they're home more often, so they may be coming across wild animals more so than they normally would. And so we just really want to make sure that the animals who do need to come in, come in, and the animals that can stay out in the wild can stay out there. Um, but every single wild animal has a job, and most of their jobs actually have a positive impact on our lives. So you actually want that animal to be around your neighborhood or be around your yard. Um, and the more that we continue to build, 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 we are just encroaching on their territory, and they are learning to adapt to us. So we have to do the same thing and learn how to adapt with, to them. Um, as more neighborhoods come in, cities, urban areas, suburban areas, the resources are abundant. And resources are what bringing the wild animals into our backyards. So that's going to be the most important thing is figuring out what is attracting the animal to your yard. Remove that first and then the animal will probably move on. A lot of people want to just trap and take the animal away, but if you leave the food, the water, or the shelter, you're just gonna put up a, bake, a big vacant sign for more animals to come in. So try to do some due diligence, figure out if you have a bird feeder or if you're feeding pets outside, um, you have a dirty grill maybe or a compost pile that's not covered. You wanna make sure that you're doing the best part on your part to not encourage those attractants. And so by having those attractants, you're gonna be attracting the wild animals. Um, so step number one, try to figure out why they're coming in the first place. But these are all reasons, these are all things that we see on a daily basis. So we really wanna just really push the idea of coexisting with our wild neighbors. So some of our favorites, we're gonna go through some of these animals. And um, again, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. I have my, my friend Kate here as well to help try to answer some of these. Um, but these little bandits are so cute, um, but they are very destructive animals. So they're super intelligent, they're very adaptable. Uh, raccoons are actually one of the one animal that have seemed to benefit being around humans. Uh, they just are really good at identifying new resources for themselves. Uh, these guys are super intelligent to the point where they actually compare them to cats and dogs. Uh, they're native to the U.S. and now they're even being found um, into the southern part of Canada. There's many different subspecies of raccoons, so they can vary in coloration, they can vary in the type of mask they have, um, but this is one of the pictures that you see, that's one of the, com that's the common raccoon that we have here in San Diego. They often appear hunched over, and so sometimes people might think like they're scary or they're growling, but that's just part of their body. Um, they just have longer legs than their front legs. Males can weigh up to about 15 pounds. Females are usually about a little bit smaller, but they can go come in about six to 12 pounds. Um, really dexterous little fingers, little um, 
hands, I guess, that allow them to manipulate their food and they're really great climbers. Uh, one thing I found out was that raccoon actually refers to the, the scientific name for raccoons refers to the washing behavior that they do. So if you guys ever see raccoons and they always want to be near a water source and wash whatever they're about to eat or they're playing with, but they believe that's more of a tactile behavior versus a washing behavior. So they're always feeling around their environment. That's a big way that they're going to be able to assess uh, where they're around. Um, they definitely prefer a forested area near a water resource. Water is the key with raccoons. However, they are adapting very, very well to suburban and urban areas. Swimming pools are a great water resource for them. Uh, people might have bird baths that will also attract raccoons. Uh, so you just want to kind of, again, do your due diligence and kind of look what's around that might be attracting that animal. They're omnivores pretty much gonna eat everything and anything, but they'll go for insects, they'll go for fruit, they'll go sometimes for carry-on, but trash, number one, is that they also have that little nickname as a trash panda because they are so great at getting into those trash cans. Uh, those dexterous little fingers can really help them out with uh, getting that lid open, and they do like to live in family groups. So if you have one raccoon, you probably have four to six around, they can easily push that trash can over, so you just really want to make sure that you're securing your trash. If you are in an apartment complex and they leave the lid open of the big dumpster, you really want to try to encourage them to close that lid because, again, free, free food resource for them, uh, and they'll definitely catch on super quickly. One thing I always tell people is never feed a raccoon. Never feed a raccoon. Never feed a raccoon. It only takes one time for them to catch on that that's an available food resource. And again, like I said, family groups. So if one comes, they're gonna bring their brothers and sisters the next day with them as well. So never feed a raccoon, you can absolutely find food on their own. Um, baby season is here and we are starting to get a lot of baby animals coming in. Raccoons are not coming in as quickly. Their seasons, what are we in? April right now. So they're gonna start having their babies a little bit right now between, usually between January through May, um, but mothers are really good mothers when it comes to raccoons. If you come across a baby raccoon and you don't see mom, we just wanna make sure you wait. Give that mom some time. She's not really going to abandon her kids. She's probably going to be around, um, but she will, be, she will move her babies from den to den if something is happening to one den. So sometimes people will see a raccoon out during the day and they get really suspicious that it might be rabid or it has some sort of illness. Um, I don't know about you guys, but if you get up in the middle of the night to grab a snack or a drink of water, raccoons and opportunistic animals will do that during the day as well. So if there's food out, they're going to wake up and go do it. If it's baby season, moms probably be looking for food even more so. And again, like I said, if something happens to one den site, she's probably going to move her kids to another den site. Uh, so just kind of really look at the situation and what's going on. Don't necessarily jump in to intervene right away. Uh, trapping is not always the best option. Some people feel like, well, why don't I just trap this animal and take them up to Julian or Campo where it's a beautiful scenery, there's resources, there's water. We will probably get into this a little bit later as well, but trapping is definitely not something that is beneficial for that wild animal. You are putting them into a brand new location where they don't know where there's food, they don't know escape routes, they don't have those resources, and then we could also be putting them into territory of another animal, some other raccoons, and they can become territorial, especially during baby season. So we're not, we're shooting ourselves in the foot when we do that. Again, just by removing the animal does you no good if you're leaving the attractant there in the first place. You're just going to invite more raccoons to come in. So we don't condone trapping. Definitely not one of our favorite things. Um, but some of the main reasons that raccoons come into us, um, we tend to get adult raccoons that are usually car strikes. And the babies, we get baby raccoons usually because someone had called a trapper, trapper trapped the mom didn't know that there was babies and now there's orphan babies that need help being rehabilitated. So those are usually the main reasons that raccoons will come into Project Wildlife. They are definitely a fun resource for us to put into. They stay with us for quite some time. When we get baby raccoons coming in, 
um, depending on the situation. They might stay with, stay with us from maybe two weeks to possibly five months. So thank you to anyone who's watching. If they're on our raccoon team, you guys are godsends and you guys put a lot of work into raising these babies and getting them released back out. Uh, so those are our little furry mask bandits. Let's go to one of my next favorites. Yay! <laughs> Some of the animals that really get a bad rap and unfortunately it's usually because of the way they look. People don't tend to like opossums because they think they look gross. They might look scraggly. They have that tail that looks like a rat. Um, they hiss at you. They show you their teeth. That's just a big display asking to leave them alone. But these guys are some of the most docile animals per se that we have here at in San Diego. There are only North, uh, North American marsupial. They have a pouch on their belly where they carry their babies. Their babies are born about the size of your pinky finger, the nail on your pinky finger. So super, super small. Uh, mom is going to give birth to them and they're just little tiny pinkies and they are going to crawl or kind of wiggle their way up into mom's pouch. She has about 13 teats to nurse her young, so the first 12 to 13 to make it into that pouch will be the ones that survive. Um, they're going to stay in mom's pouch for about a month or so until they're ready to go on a little piggyback ride on mom's back and then they're off. Uh, opossums never stop growing so they live short little lives not usually usually females survive one breeding season um, but a three or four year old opossum is an old opossum they have really poor eyesight so when you look at opossums you'll see that they have the whiskers kind of like cats do so that's really good for tactile feeling around their environment they have good hearing and a good sense of smell um, so one way to deter an opossum from your yard is to maybe put some smelly things out in the yard that aren't pleasant for them. Again, we'll touch base on that a little bit at the end of the program. They're nocturnal. They're nomadic, so it means they're always on the move. They don't technically have a territory like most animals you would think. Um, they're just gonna keep moving. So just because you see an opossum in your yard tonight doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna be there tomorrow night. They're not the sharpest tools in the shed, my friends. So they growl, they drool, they hiss, they open that mouth, they try to make themselves look scary, but they're not super fast. They don't jump out at you. Um, I'm pretty sure we've all heard the saying playing possum, and it's because they play dead when they get scared. And it's not even that they're playing. They go into a real death-like catatonic state because they are so terrified of human beings. Their heartbeat will slow down, they can play dead, They'll, they can emit a goo to make them smell like they're dead, and they can play dead for five minutes to five hours. So it's not really the best defense system, but again, they really mean you no harm. If you leave an opossum alone, they will definitely leave you alone. But you really kind of want them in your yard. These guys are nature's little garbage men. They'll eat mice, Rats, slugs, snails, worms, opossums can eat up to 5,000 ticks in one season for us. They'll eat dead rotting fruit, they'll, dead rotting fruit, dead rotting animals and they'll eat rotting fruit. They're just picking up after us. So these guys are also super helpful because they're actually immune to rattlesnake venom. So they can eat some of those snakes for us as well. They have a lower body temperature than most mammals do. So that makes them immune to the venom and also it makes rabies really difficult to grow inside of them. So we don't wanna say they're completely immune to rabies because any mammal can contract rabies, but the chances of these guys getting rabies is really slim to none. So having them around your house, feel lucky. Uh, they're super helpful, they're always on the move and um, easily deterred again by sense, sound, dogs or cats, these guys can get really scared really easily. It's their baby season right now. So we are definitely getting in baby opossums right now quite a lot. And unfortunately, it's a lot because mothers are getting hit by cars. Um, not as much though, because there's not a lot of cars on the road. So that's a good thing. One good rule of thumb though, if you do come across a baby opossum, Sometimes people say that they're really small and they're like, oh, they must be abandoned or orphaned because they're too tiny to be on their own. 
mom lets them go pretty early on. So if you look at a baby opossum and the tip of their nose to the base of their butt, so you don't include their tail, if they are about your middle finger to the base of your palm, if they're that size or bigger, they're on their own already. Anything smaller than that, though, would definitely need to come into Project Wildlife. So kind of, you know, look at them, check them out, and if you can kind of eyeball it and see that they're pretty much on their own already, that'll be the best thing for them is to leave them out in the wild. We are coming on to our second poll, Miss Elkie, and it's going to be possibly about these guys. So if you want to launch that for me. Hold on a quick second. Get yeah, that one going. <laughs> Here we go, number two. And true or false, skunks only spray when they feel threatened. Shouldn't take too long. <laughs> I'm watching, watch, we're almost there. There we go, we're gonna end the polling and share the results. Carly? Ooh, okay, so we got about half and half here. That's a really, that's really interesting. So skunks also, not the best animals to, they have a really great protection system, but their spray is on their only defense. Skunks don't just go around spraying people just because they want to, so they will only spray when they feel threatened. They don't spray if they're like come across another skunk, it's not like an attractant smell for them or anything like that. It is literally the skunk's only defense to spray. Um, let's bring up some of that information. Come on. There we go. Um, skunks are super, super nearsighted. So if you guys want to do this with me, I tell the kids to do this all the time. But if you put your thumb on your nose and you look at your first knuckle right there, that is about how far a skunk can see in front of their face. Super, super nearsighted. And so they will rarely attack unless they are feeling directly threatened. Um, these guys are super helpful because they're big on insect eaters. Uh, they will definitely go for some of those rodents as well, lizards, frogs, but they will also eat some animals that can be dangerous to humans like black widows and scorpions. So they have the really strong teeth and um, can crunch down on those animals. So again, you kind of want them around. But they rarely attack, so um, that common stripe on the back. So we also have spotted skunks here in San Diego. They're more rare than the striped skunks. Striped skunks are definitely more common than the spotted skunks, but you may see them both sometimes. Spotted skunks are a little bit more uh, out towards the mountain area, a little bit more. Uh, they want to stay away from humans a lot more than the striped skunks. Um, but if you let the skunks know that you're there, again, so let's say if you're walking your pet at night and you see the skunk across the street, they can't see you. They don't know you're there. So I always say talk softly to them. You may seem a little crazy if you're talking to a skunk at nighttime, but you're letting them know that you're there and that they should try to get away as soon as possible, which is what they want to do. So usually if you kind of talk softly to a skunk, they're gonna give you those warning signs. So they'll stomp their front feet, they stomp their back feet, they fluff up all their fur to make themselves look bigger. The spotted skunks have the ability to do the little behavior where they stand up on their front hands and do a little handstand. They're trying to tell you as much as possible to get away from them. Um, they don't want you to bother them. They don't want to bother you. If you let them go their way, they will be super happy about that. One thing people don't know is that skunks, their spray, they don't have an unlimited amount of it. So once they spray maybe about five to seven good sprays, they're out completely. And it takes them time to refill that supply. And so during that time when they're trying to refill it, they're completely vulnerable. So that's their main source of defense. So if they don't have to spray you, they will not. It is only when they are super threatened. So sometimes when we let our pet go out, our dog go out at nighttime to go to the bathroom, 
they don't know, dogs don't know how to read skunk behavior, all of a sudden your dog's nose is in the skunk's face. He has no idea what's going on. Your dog gets sprayed. So I always like to give um, the wild animals a heads up that I'm gonna let my pets out. I clap my hands, I just give it a little shout. Uh, you, if you had like a big property, maybe get pots and pans and knock them together. Let the animal know that you're coming or that you're letting your animal out and give them a chance to scurry away. One rule of thumb, another one, my friends, is that wild animals don't want to be around human beings. And that is one really good sign that if a wild animal ever allows you to approach it or if it comes running up to you, something's wrong. It could be an imprinted animal, so they might have been found as a baby and now they were hand raised and now they think humans are the ones supposed to give them food. Um, something could be seriously wrong with that animal if it just like lets you walk up to it, could have injured wing or something. So that's always a good rule of thumb. Um, tomato juice does nothing but make you red. It is hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, and dish soap. Mix all those ingredients first together in a bowl and maybe start on a small spot on your dog first. And if, fair warning, if you have a dark colored dog, you might really wanna start on that small spot first so that you don't turn your dark colored dog orange and bleach it because of the hydrogen peroxide. Um, but you may not care because it'll start breaking down that chemical compound and your dog is going, the smell will start dissipating. So what we say is, Put that solution on your dog, keep it on for five minutes, rinse it off, repeat, rinse it off, repeat. The more you do it, the more it's gonna start breaking down that chemical compound on your pet. Um, if it gets on the clothes, toss your clothes. Um, the spray can kind of act like pepper spray. So if you get it directly in your face, it's really irritating and that's why when your dog gets sprayed, the first thing they wanna do is to rub up on your couch and your carpet and everything possible because they wanna get that spray off. Uh, so if you can catch your dog before they come into the house, try to just get them straight into the bathroom. Um, but usually this concoction that we have, most people have those in their home already, so it's good to know, um, but yeah. Skunks don't want to spray if they don't have to. Um, if you're having issues with skunks coming in the yard, they're big on eating grubs and worms. And so like if you just um, put some sod down, there might be some grubs in there. And so like if you come across a hole that's dug in your yard, maybe about like that wide and only this far down. So it's not like a gopher hole because it doesn't continue, but it's just wide enough and deep enough that's usually skunks. So they're just trying to get down and to get those insects in the yard. And if you're having issues with that, vinegar, apple cider vinegar. They don't like the smell, it's too strong. If you have an area where you know they're coming in, you gotta do it every day, you gotta be persistent, but like get a, a rag, soak it with the vinegar, put it in the areas that you know that you're having skunk issues. And again, do it at dusk and you'll prevent them from coming in. Um, there's also grub away nematodes, so that takes care, if you put that on your lawn, it will take care of the grubs that are in your lawn, which are attracting the skunks in the first place. Um, and then also cayenne pepper, a little bit too uh, peppery for them, and so that can also do some deterring as well. The basic thing that you want to look at when you're trying to deter a wild animal is look at what scent scents they use the most. So are they visual? Do they use their hearing? Are they using their sense of smell? Are they more tactile? And try to utilize that information and get whatever you can to accost that sense. So if they're using their sound more, get a radio, do something that is going to bother them. Make it uncomfortable for them to be there and they'll move on to your neighbor's yard. Just kidding. Maybe your neighbor doesn't want them there. You might want them there more than they do, but that's a way to gently encourage their departure. Again, we'll touch more on that at the end of the program. Some cutie pies that we have are the bats and our poor little bats right now that hopefully people are not too upset at our bat species because these guys are super helpful. Um, there are over 1,200 different species of bats in the world. They make up one third of the mammal population. Uh, and there are, they're almost on every continent as well. These guys are super helpful at um, being nature's most effective bug control. And they're big pollinators as well. So they pollinate a ton of different flowers and plants. So if you like bananas or mangoes or cashews or figs, or tequila, 
you like bats. They're the main pollinator for the agave plant. Chocolate as well. So bats are super important. So they're pollinators and then they're also insect control. Um, one little brown bat can eat up to 60 mosquitoes in one hour for us. Uh, farmers in Texas rely on the bat population to help them with their, their crops because some of these bats focus specifically on the insects that eat their crops. So they want to make sure that they have the bats around. Um, these guys are really clean little creatures, just as much as like your cat would clean themselves in one day. It's kind of the same thing with the bat. They always want to be clean. So they're always grooming themselves constantly, trying to make sure that they have that nice clean coat. Um, they are super closely related to primates. They are one of the slowest reproducing mammals in the world, usually with one pup a year, maybe two if they have twins, but one pup is all they'll have for the entire year. So if we start persecuting bats, we're gonna really diminish their population really quickly. Um, these guys sometimes get a bad rap because people think they wanna drink their blood, drink your blood. So out of the 1,200 different species of bats, Three are blood drinkers, and two of them go for poultry. So one bat out of all those bats drinks mammal blood. And that one bat has given all the bats a bad name, but it's been really good in the past few years. There's been a lot of education going around about bats. So most people are not super scared of them anymore about drinking their blood or getting caught in their hair. Um, but back in the day, that's kind of what happened. And it's not even human blood. It's cows. So we don't have anything to worry about and all three of those bats live in South America. We have no blood drinking bats here in North America, um, but they're really having a hard time because if we start decreasing their population because we're putting more pesticides out on those crops, we can really affect the bats and then we're basically again shooting ourselves in the foot because we're killing off our own, our own um, bug control. So they're super helpful. Um, rabies is a real disease and bats are one of our rabies vector species in San Diego. Bats, skunks, what is it? Bat, why have I not said this? Bats, bats, skunks, foxes, raccoons. Glad I have Kate here. I haven't had to say this stuff in a while, so sorry guys. Those are our four rabies vector species. It means that they have the possibility of carrying rabies without actually showing the signs that they have it. Um, so always, 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 no matter what, if you come across a wild animal, always just protect yourself, gloves, t-shirts, sweatshirts, something. You never want to touch an animal with your bare hands, but especially you never want to touch a bat with your bare hands. Like I said, they're very good at cleaning themselves and grooming themselves. So the way rabies is transferred from animal to humans is through the saliva. And so that's why they say when you get bit by an animal, always go to the doctor. But the one thing with bats is that if you picked up a bat with your bare hands, they could have saliva on their body. And even if you had like a little tiny cut on your hand, if you say, well, the bat didn't bite me, um, still super, super, super important. Never touch a bat with your bare hands. Um, so any animal, any mammal can contract rabies. Bats are just a little more susceptible. They're having a big problem right now, not only with this whole pandemic that's going on, but it's called white nose syndrome. Um, and white nose syndrome is a fungus that can affect a bat and it starts kind of growing on their nose and it mostly will affect colony bats. So not every bat wants to live in a big colony. Some of them roost by themselves. Some of them like to be in a big area or a um, area where there's a lot of them. So if one of them gets white nose, it can infect the entire colony. And again, it's just a fungus that grows on them. So like say if it's a bats that are hibernating, they're gonna wake up and like scratch themselves and again, get the metabolism, the metabolism going. Um, and it can be really detrimental to them. So, so far, no cases of white nose syndrome in the state of California. However, I think there may have been a few cases in Oregon um, and Washington. I don't know if my bat expert is watching, but Cindy, we actually have a whole presentation that we just do on bats. So stay tuned, because I hopefully will be able to do that later in the year. Um, but right now with COVID-19, um, they are definitely doing a lot of research on bats right now to make sure that so far there has no been no signs of any of our North American bats contracting COVID giving it to humans or for humans giving it to bats or bats to bats. Um, 
but they don't know for sure yet. So right now, the state of California is allowing Project Wildlife to still take in injured or sick or orphaned bats, um, but at the moment, we can't release them. So things are still coming down the pipeline to make sure that we're following everything in the protocols, um, but thankfully, we only have like a handful of bats in our care right now. I wanna say it's like less than five, um, but we have a small, wonderful bat team of volunteers, so they're, making sure that there's extra protection and extra measures that are being implemented right now to make sure that we're that we're not giving it to the bats um, and just making sure that um, maybe if there's a vaccine that comes out through for the animals that we can help them out but we're just making sure that we're really keeping an eye on them um, on a normal basis we'll get bats into project wildlife um, tree trim so we have foliage roosting bats so that means they like to live in the trees and so a lot of these some of them actually use the palm trees the palm tree um, skirts that are around them and uh, the little one that you see right here is a yellow I want to say it's a yellow bat these guys do ro roost in the palm fronds and so sometimes they can get trimmed out and bats are mammals and they're the only mammal capable of flight so unlike a bird that has hollow bones and can just take off right away when they feel threatened. Bats actually have to like warm their body up and warm their muscles up to allow them to fly. So if during the day when they're sleeping and roosting in those palm fronds and our tree trimmers go and cut them down, they're not, they don't have that ability to just fly away. So they fall that 80 to 100 foot drop down to the bottom. Um, and so we'll tend to get bats a lot found on the ground, and usually it's due because they were tree trimmed. Um, bats can get caught in glue traps, so you put a glue trap out to catch the mosquitoes, here comes the one that eats the mosquitoes. So we get them caught in glue traps. Um, sometimes they're caught in pools. Bats don't actually just like stop to take a drink of water. They have to do like a little droop down and just hopefully on a big body of water, take a little sip and then they fly up. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a huge ton of options of bodies of water for them to do, but we do have pools again. So sometimes they fly down and they drip down into the pool and there's not enough flyway for them to come back up so they can hit the edge of the pool and that's how sometimes we get bats that, have been, that are caught in a pool. Um, frog logs. Frog logs, if you have a pool, are super amazing contraptions that you can buy on Amazon for like 20 bucks. It sits on the side of the pool and has like a little um, little, lead, little walkway from the pool water up to the outside of the pool. So usually when the animals get caught in the pool, they're going along the rim. They can get on this little lily pad type of thing, dry out for a little bit, walk up the little ramp, and then they can fly away. Um, really great for all sorts of animals if you have a pool and you get any animals stuck in them. Frog logs, super helpful. And another species that we can spend a whole hour and a half talking about. Um, so I'm just gonna cover this one really quickly, my friends. Coyotes, they are definitely one of the most persecuted animals in the United States that we have. Um, but we will try to hopefully educate some of our friends right now. They are part of the dog family, super curious, super adaptable, um, and learn very quickly. They've expanded their territory, believe it or not, 1800s, 1850s. Coyotes only used to exist in the middle part of the United States. Um, humans, expansion towards the West, they followed suit. And then also, again, we didn't do ourselves any favors because we put a bounty on wolves, which the government said as many wolves as you kill let us know and we'll actually send you money for them and wolves are the main competition for coyotes so when we had a population of wolves here in the united states it actually kept coyote numbers at bay and kept them down and manageable well we killed off all the wolves coyotes have no apparent competition or predators so they've moved east west north and south become very adaptable to different environments um, these guys often mate for life. They're actually really good parents. Um, usually they only have a litter or kits once a year. Um, they will stay, it's about four to eight babies usually born in around April and May. Um, they have a really high pup mortality, so not all the babies have a really good success rate of surviving. Here in San Diego, we don't really have the resources to allow for packs to develop. 
it's packs are usually different family member di different family groups coming together we usually only have family groups here in san diego so it may only be a group of five coyotes but they can sound like 25 coyotes they have the ability to like throw their voices they have a ton of different vocalizations for different things um, so just because you hear coyotes howling also doesn't mean they just caught a pet doesn't mean that they caught an animal coyotes are actually really smart and they don't want to let other coyotes know that they just caught food so it's usually when they're howling or yowling it's not because they have food because they don't want to announce it to the world that hey i have food come and steal it from me so it's usually more times than not that they're just communicating to each other um, females so like i said they'll stay in family groups and there's usually two mating pair no so there's two individuals that are the mating pair everyone else below them they are what we call behaviorally sterile they are actually not allowed to mate until they become a certain age so we go and trap or kill intentionally and we start messing up that hierarchy we start allowing, that can start allowing immature females to start breeding before they should. Um, so again, we really wanna make sure that we're doing ourselves a favor and not shooting ourselves in the foot. And so there can be brazen coyotes and there is, you know, there are some loners out there that are coming into the backyard, but for the most part, coyotes are actually really skittish um, and wary animals. They don't really wanna be around humans too much. But again, if they're finding resources in our neighborhoods, they're going to stick around. Um, for the most part, coyotes can eat rodents. They're usually their main diet is rodents, rabbits, insects, lizards, snakes. They like vegetables and fruit. They're pretty opportunistic. Um, a lot of animal coyotes who have passed away, they've done necropsies and looked inside their stomach. And most of them have trash and rabbits in their stomach system. Not a lot of them had pets. So pets only account for maybe 2% of the coyote's total diet. Um, I know that's not the case that we normally see, um, but for the most part, they're not really trying to go after our pets. However, it's our job to make sure that we keep our pets safe. So now more than ever, you really probably want to keep your cat indoors just because like we've seen that the tiger caught COVID, two cats in New York now have tested positive. Um, so maybe it's the best thing all around to keep your cat inside or a catio. It's like a patio for your cat. Um, make sure that you're keeping your dogs on a, le a shorter leash. The um, extender leashes are never the best thing because that your pet can be seven feet ahead of you and turn a corner you never know what's around that corner it could be another dog um, it could be someone who's scared of dogs um, or it could be a coyote so always best to keep your pets safe we're the ones in charge of them um, we're responsible for keeping them safe coyotes can be fast they are really skilled at jumping so coyote rollers are a great option to have on your fence line um, it's just a rolling beam, so if a coyote is trying to jump your fence, they can't catch their paws enough to get themselves to pull themselves up. Um, so that's one thing you can think of installing. Um, but it's really sad because coyotes are just like, like I said in the beginning, they're one of the most highly persecuted animals. Uh, over 500,000 coyotes are killed every single year. They're actually killing contests in different states where people get paid for how many coyotes they kill. They get a bonus if there's pups included. Um, it's really quite horrible. And so education is the key right now and uh, just do some research, but we actually have helpful handouts on our website. Again, I'll, hopefully I'll get you to that at the end to show you that we have three of our coyote hazing guidelines, why coyotes are there and the fact that killing just doesn't really do us any good. When we start bringing their population numbers down, all the only thing that happens is they just rebound super quickly. If there's more resources, so if we kill coyotes, there's more resources. You have more resources, you get more coyotes. You get bigger litters. Litters are more successful. There's not a, such a high mortality rate. So again, just kind of doing our research, keeping your pet food inside, make sure that you're removing those water resources. Again, clean up after the bird feeders. Some people don't always put two and two together, um, but the bird seed falls, attracts rodents, 
get coyotes. So just making sure you're doing your due diligence and uh, making sure you're cleaning that grill. And then just make sure none of your neighbors are feeding wild animals. Some of the time I'll get the call that people are like, well, there's animals here. And then they find out that their neighbor is just willingly putting out food for these guys. Um, never a good thing. We never suggest people feed wildlife. It's just too much because then animals can become reliant on the humans for the food source. And also you're just going to attract them into the neighborhood. And actually some cities have their own guidelines where it, you are breaking the law if you're feeding wildlife. So again, do some research, help coyotes out. Um, we do want them around because they are really great rodent control. And then also one of those guidelines, those um, offered the things that we have for you are hazing. Hazing is the best thing that we can do for coyotes. It's scaring them again, reasserting that we're the dominant ones. So just get big, bad, and loud because again, coyotes are dogs. You can train your dog. You can train a coyote. You can train them to be comfortable in the neighborhood. And you can train them to be uncomfortable in the neighborhood. So if every time a coyote comes around and they see a human and the human doesn't do anything, they're just going to learn, oh, okay, well, that person's not going to do anything to me. I'm just going to keep pushing my boundaries and see how close I can get. If they see a human and the human like puts their arms up and screams at them and throw things at like near them, don't throw it at them, but throw it near them. Water guns, uh, even literally just putting pennies in a soda can, cover the top and shaking that, that will scare them away. So we just have to do our part again in instilling that natural fear that they have of us. Um, so we have that handout online as well. And then usually we'll get coyotes into Project Wildlife, um, usually because they're sick. Um, mange is a big thing right now that we're getting animals uh, that we get coyotes in. Mange is a, a skin disease and it just like eats away at them. So it's really bad. Um, we also got lots of information on our website to check out for coyotes. Okay, almost there guys. <laughs> we're gonna touch base on these guys real quick. Uh, just because sometimes people don't remember that owls are big predators. That great horned owl, that's called the tiger of the sky for a reason. Um, not only can coyotes go after your smaller pets, but sometimes owls might as well. So uh, again, just making sure that we're protecting our pets, watching after them. Um, and especially during the springtime, you just don't want to leave your pets unattended just because you just never know what could happen. Two main families of owls, bear with me, Titanidae and Strigidae. I, <laughs> I had to ask the staff that too, and they didn't know either. So hopefully that was right. A uh, ton of different species of owls. We have about six to eight different types of owls in San Diego. Um, and then during winter time, we have a few more that come through. Usually really soft plumage, uh, feathering down their legs. They have the downward po pointing beaks, super, super sharp talons. Um, barn owls have that really recognizable uh, facial disc around their face found all over the world. Uh, main parts of their diets are small mammals, birds, rodents, insects, great horned owls, hunt skunks. So if you have a great horned owl around your house, good job on you. Owls have a really poor sense of smell. In general, all birds have a poor sense of smell. So one of those things that we've heard, you touch a baby bird, mom won't take it back. Birds cannot smell whether or not you touch them or not. However, that wonderful saying has probably saved the lives of many birds because people didn't touch them. Um, I'm not, I haven't included fledging birds in this talk because that could be, again, its whole talk on its own, but birds are learning how to fly. They're just hopping around. Um, again, when to intervene, when not to intervene. Really tell people to go to the website, check out those resources. Um, smaller owl species can be hunted by bigger owl species. Uh, these guys, some owls can live from five years to 25 years, depending on what species it is. Um, these guys are your built-in rodent control. Barn owls have a super high metabolism and can eat anywhere between maybe five to seven rodents a night. Double that if it's a mother barn owl feeding her babies. So owls are great rodent control, so putting up owl boxes, uh, making sure that if you don't have to trim the tree because not all of them want to be in the box. Great horned owls actually just like a big tree that they can put their nest in the middle of a nook. And so you really want to try to attract them. If you're having really a really bad rodent issue, try to attract the owls before you start using rodenticides because unfortunately people start putting out rodent bait. The rodents eat it. They don't die right away. 
our beautiful owls come through, eat that poisoned rodent, and then they're getting sick on that end. So one big thing that we wanna make sure that we're not doing is putting up an owl box and then putting out rodent bait at the same time. Um, you're basically just killing your built-in rodent control. Okay, real quick, last poll. <laughs> Elkie, we got one more poll to go and do. Hold on just a second. This is all new. So we learned a word. There we go. Continue. If you guys have to leave at one hour, thank you for being here, but a few more slides. Okay, here we go. How much time per day does a mother cottontail rabbit spend with her babies? What do you guys think? Three hours, six hours, 20 minutes, 45, and one hour. We're halfway through. Thanks for participating, everyone. <laughs> okay, looks like we're there. Let me end the polling and share our results. Oh, okay, three hours, 20 minutes, 45, one hour. Thank you guys so much for participating. Um, whoever said 20 minutes a day, you guys just hit the nail on the head right there. 20 minutes a day, that is all for Mother Cottontail to be spending with her kids. And cottontails are the number one rabbit that we tend to see here in San Diego, although we do have jackrabbits and bush rabbits as well. Um, but these guys will get about 550 rabbits in every year, 98% of them are cottontail rabbits. Uh, these guys are, they nest in usually a shallow fur-lined depression in the grass and uh, usually covered with maybe some sticks and leaves and everything. Mother cottontail only comes when the sun is coming up and the sun is going down, so dusk and dawn, they're crepuscular. And She'll stand over her nest of baby bunnies. She'll nurse them for about 10 minutes. When they're done, she covers them back up with sticks and leaves, and then she spends the rest of her time in the bushes. When the sun is going down, she does the same exact thing. Cottontails are hunted by almost any omnivore or carnivore in San Diego. So she doesn't want to spend time with her children because she does not want to attract predators to her nest. They will start to catch on. If she's hanging out around a nest, those red tail hawks, red shoulder hawks, uh, the Cooper's hawks, all those animals are going to start noticing and they're going to start coming after her baby. So she doesn't want to spend as much, a lot of time with her kids. And uh, these guys grow really fast. So sometimes people will bring in a cottontail. Let me see. Oh, I do have it. Sometimes, really, my friends, cottontails are, when they're on their own, they are not much bigger than this ears up, eyes open, they're usually already on their own. So mom's only with her kids for about three weeks. And then, sorry, there you go kids. Um, but she'll have babies, she can have babies about twice a year here in San Diego. So we get a lot of baby cottontails coming into us. Un people think they're orphaned, but they're not truly orphaned. So we wanna again, make sure you watch and wait and if you can, if you see a, baby, a nest of baby cottontails and you're just not quite sure whether or not mom is there or not, get a pair of sticks. Um, if it's in your backyard, maybe you can sprinkle a little ring of flour around the nest, um, but usually a pair of sticks over the nest in the shape of an X. Come back uh, the next day and if those sticks have been moved or you see little footprints through the flour and babies are still there, mom was there best thing for these baby cottontails is to stay with mom. But we get very well-intentioned people who bring the nest of baby bunnies in and say they're orphaned and they have a full belly of milk. And so we know they were just bunny napped. So don't bunny nap this year. Spread the word about cottontail babies. If there is a dead, a dead cottontail somewhere, somewhere around, then probably it could be the mother. If your cat is bringing them in, Anything cat caught, bring into Project Wildlife. Cats have a lot of bacteria in their mouth, so they can cause diseases with the wild animals. Dog caught is a little bit different. If your dog catches, caught, if your dog catches an animal, and let's say you're able to see it and you look at it, and like there's no blood, there's no nothing broken, um, 
if the animal can rebound, we're trying to encourage people to leave them out there because we're really trying to minimize the amount of animals coming to Project Wildlife that don't need to. Um, but if you ever have concern, always bring them in. Um, we have our intake staff out there that can help educate people. But cat caught, definitely brought in, but don't bunny nap if you don't have to. Here's a little picture of what that nest looks like. This is actually a jackrabbit, so she's way bigger than cottontails, but that's just an example of how they feed. Really quickly, babies get in there and then she's done. But this is what the nest of baby cottontails usually looks like. And when people find them and say, oh my gosh, there's no one around, and they bring them in. Okay. So my friends, why do you guys think wild animals are here in San Diego? And it's basically, who doesn't love San Diego? You have some of the best weather here all year round. Um, we have some migratory species of birds who are not stupid, crows, and uh, they set up shop because they know we have kind of resources, we have great weather, um, but a lot of wild animals are facing loss of habitat throughout the United States and into Canada. Um, a lot of animals are being displaced because of agriculture and urbanization, and they're learning to survive on trash and other food resources versus the food that they're supposed to be eating. So humans are generating a ton of resources for them. Um, and then our houses can be a great place to put a den or a nest. And so that's a lot of things, a lot of what animals are looking for, food, water, and shelter. And just remember coexisting is that key. Oh, real quick. Some of the biggest threats that we have for wild animals is that a lot of adults are intentionally trapped and killed or shot illegally. Um, a lot of them are in, it poisoned intentionally. Um, sometimes it's secondhand poisoning, but vehicle collisions, dog caught, da dog caught, cat caught, nests are disturbed. So people are trimming their trees right now. Just really, again, hopefully like watch that bush or watch that tree and see if you see birds going in and out. And um, if you come across a nest of baby birds, just stop, let mom and dad finish raising their babies. And then um, usually with baby birds, it's maybe four to six weeks, for depending on the species. As soon as those eggs are laid, four to six weeks later, those babies are fledged and out of the nest. So that'll be the best time to take that nest down once those babies are gone. And again, if you can enjoy it, try to enjoy it. That animal picked their area or your area for a reason. Um, either they felt that there was a good resource or they felt safe there. Um, so if you can enjoy wildlife right now, more power to you. Ways to coexist, you guys, is uh, never approach an animal or they're young. I don't know about if I have some mothers out there, but you're going to protect your baby. Same thing with wild animals. Um, wildlife will generally leave you alone. Again, like I said earlier, if a wild animal ever allows you to approach it, something's wrong. Um, never feed a wild animal, my friends. I know bird feeders are a little bit different, um, but right now I'm, I've actually been getting some emails of people who say, well, no one can go to Lake Murray anymore, so what's happening to the ducks? No one's feeding them. Well, that's a problem that we've created because we go there, feed them bread, bread super bad for ducks, um, but we've created that issue and now people are being forced to stay in, in their house and now people are wondering what are the animals doing? They're going to find their resources again when they get hungry enough they're going to go out and find their own food but this is what how we can create that problem for ourselves if we're intentionally feeding animals all the time. Do your best to be aware of breeding season. Usually in San Diego it's January through May and uh, for some of these guys can even go a little bit further into the summer months. And just, if you do come across a mother with their young, please just try to give them time to raise their young. No one else has to keep their kids for 18 years, um, even longer for some of you guys or us. <laughs> so usually with wildlife, they're raised their kids, they're done pretty quickly. So if you can give them that chance, that time to raise their kids. Um, and then, like I said, just give the wild animals a chance to know that you're gonna let your pet out before you actually do. Uh, real quick, some just humane deterrence. Again, just making sure you find out what those attractants are. So making sure that you're removing any trash or debris, debris, you're securing your fence line, that you're making sure that all your containers and trash cans are sealed, you're sealing up your structures. A mouse can get into your house in the hole the size of a dime. So you really want to make sure that you're not inviting them to come in because you have holes or there's holes in the attic or the roof. Um, just really want to try to help prevent it from happening in the first place. 
Apple cider vinegar is a really strong smell for a lot of animals, so you can put it around the perimeter. Capacin is a non-toxic irritant that can be really, uh, a lot of animals won't like the smell because it's so peppery. You can sprinkle that around plants or gardens or trash cans. Um, you can even mix capucin in with bird seed too, so maybe you're deterring some of those squirrels. You're keeping compost secure, you're eliminating that water resource. And then again, guys, motion activated lights, radios, or sprinklers, that quick, sudden jolt is going to scare the animal. So if it's a light, like so if it's at nighttime and you have one of the um, motion activated lights, don't put it on top of the house, put it down on the bottom where the animal is gonna walk in front of. When they walk in front of that motion detected light and it blasts a real flashlight at them, it'll scare them. If you do it up top, you're just gonna light their pathway for them. So you wanna just try it again, make it mostly and most and comfortable as possible for them to be there and they will move on. And again, just make sure no one is feeding them intentionally and encouraging them. If you, <laughs> you guys probably didn't know this, but this entire time that I have been talking with you, I've had a little buddy. And he's sleeping. You rotate him. Oh, there he is. So guys, say hi to Chuck. Chuck is our Western Screech Owl Ambassador. He's one of our newest ambassadors that we've had here at Project Wildlife. We believe Chuck was hit by a car. Um, when those owls are hunting their food and their food runs across the road, so do they, and they don't look left or right before they cross the street. I know, you see, you're hearing me, huh? So every time I turn you, you're just gonna look at me. So we believe he was hit by a car. When he came in, this whole side of his face was completely inflamed. And so we waited for that inflammation to go down, but it turned out that he didn't really have anything, any receptors in that eye anymore. So we removed the eye to prevent it from getting infected. And we don't believe his hearing is that great on that side. So one eye, one a loss of a hearing is definitely not gonna be a releasable wild animal, um, but he is actually a great and very calm animal. And like I said, he's just been sitting here this entire time that I've been talking with you guys. And that is Chuck, my friends. And finally, there we are. Kate's been typing away like crazy over here, so I'm assuming there's been some questions coming through. Um, like, are there, do we have any time to answer some of them, if there are any to answer? Um, we actually just had um, one I don't think that you covered through the presentation. You did talk about tree trimming, but when is the best time to tree trim? Ooh, great answer. Great question. So the best time to trim your trees is going to be in the winter time. So unfortunately, it's not the best answer to have, but it's going to be November and December. And then even into January, you want to be a little cautious because our hummingbirds and our barn owls will start nesting in January. Um, if you have to trim right now, though, like I said, just do your due diligence, and if you can just sit out and watch, don't be super close because the birds won't come very close to the tree if you're right there. But again, if you see a lot of activity, and if you see um, feces, because where they're making a nest, there's going to be a lot of poop. So if you're seeing that, that's a really good indication that there is a nest in there, and uh, if you kind of look around and see, I know some bushes and trees don't allow for that, but if you do hire a tree trimmer, um, ask them what they do if they come across an active nest. An active nest means that there are eggs laid. If a bird is making a nest, take it down. If it's not in the best place for you or that animal, take it down as they're building it. You can definitely take down a nest as it's being built. Once it becomes active, you cannot touch it. A lot of our birds are federally protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and so it is a federal law to trim a tree when there's an active nest in it. Unfortunately, it's really hard to catch tree trimmers in the act. U.S. Fish and Wildlife are the ones who are responsible for this act, this treaty, and unfortunately, you have to have a video of the tree trimmer coming across the nest, seeing that it's active, and then still continues to trim it down in order for them to prosecute that tree trimmer. So again, if you're doing this around your yard,
talk to them before you hire them and ask them what they would do if they came across a nest of baby birds. Um, and so fall into winter is going to be your true best time to trim trees. And not only is that good for our animals, that's best for the tree as well. Good question. I think that's it. This, the big question, um, we will remind everybody that the recording and the slides will be available um, early next week. Carly will send them to your email. Um, but I think we are so appreciative of you all attending and um, one practicing last, with us. Yeah, oh, have one, one, last, one last thing I just want to show you guys. This is the website for Project Wildlife. Um, if you just go, you can either go to sdhumane.org and then just go to the programs and pick Project Wildlife. Oh, hang on. You're still seeing the PowerPoint? Yeah. Let me see. Close that. Uh, don't save. Now do you see the website? Oh, now it's just me. Screen sharing has stopped. Okay, let me share my screen one more time. Share. Okay. So. You can either go to sdhumane.org and then go to programs and click Project Wildlife or just type in Project Wildlife and it'll take you straight to this landing page. If you scroll down, here are the quick links. I found a baby wild animal, what should I do? And what should you do if you found an injured wild animal? Super helpful. And then if you scroll down even more, you'll see all these different coexisting pages. This is where a lot of the information that I just told you guys is going to be, but the one about coyotes is going to be the coexisting with wildlife, coyotes and large predators. And this is the page where you are going to find these quick tips. So the hazing, preventing coyote conflicts and solutions for coyote conflicts. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys that real quick, but yay, we did it. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend and we will be contacting you next week. Thanks guys. Really Bye. thank you for joining us.